Welcome to our procedural in motion panel. Uh, my name is not Rob Redman. Uh, he couldn't make it, unfortunately. Uh, my name is Christian Bargill. I'm head of R&D at uh, Side Effect Software. Very happy to be here. And uh, very happy and privileged to be sitting down for a conversation with uh, five esteemed uh, colleagues from the industry. They're all CG experts working in the advertising field uh, who have kindly accepted our invitation to talk about their work, their challenges, the state of the advertising industry, and uh, possibly the ways in which Houdini uh, is impacting their quality of life and the rush to the next deadline. So welcome, everyone. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, the names of the panelists uh, are correct, and I will ask them now to introduce uh, themselves and just give us a, just a brief uh, background, if we can start with you, Will. Sure, I'm Will McNeil, and I'm an art director at The Mill in London. I work in our design department, um, which is a sort of uh, little corner of The Mill. Uh, the Mill is about 800 people working over four studios around the world. We call ourselves a, a content creation studio, basically we we make everything from TV commercials uh, right down to um, uh, apps and uh, VR experiences. Uh, hi, my name's Lawrence Pankhurst. I'm the CG supervisor at Sky. Uh, I've been there about four years. I've been doing CG for 27 years, getting paid for doing it anyway. Um, I look after the CG that goes out on our channel, basically. That's it. Um, I've worked at the mill, jellyfish, and other places as well. Um, ask me some questions later if you want. Um, hello, I'm uh, Simon French. Uh, I'm currently joint head of CG at Electric Theatre, um, but I've only been there two weeks. Uh, <laughs> before that, I was at Framestore um, advertising for 13 years, um, and I was the head of CG there. Hello, hi, my name is Tim Bolland. Uh, I've been at Glassworks Amsterdam now for the last eight years. And uh, I started off in London and we're a sort of small to mid-sized boutique studio. Um, we do what I think is quite nice work and yeah, it's been an honor to come here today and talk about moving on to Houdini. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Peter Briggi. Uh, I'm an FX artist at Jellyfish Pictures. Uh, I graduated a year ago, so you know. Hi everyone, I can give a fresh perspective on the industry and all that stuff. Um, I worked both in film and advertising, uh, and I've worked exclusively in Houdini the entire time. So you know, that's my view of things. All right, thank you guys. A um, couple of questions and we can keep this really fluid. Um, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, what's the creative process like for you? Um, how do things go from you know, the, the client brief all the way to the finished work? Uh, where I work, it's pretty open. We tend to get our briefs in a pretty raw state because uh, one part of the mill called Mill Plus, which we are involved with, is not just uh, creating visual effects after receiving a brief, but actually uh, being involved in the development of the, the creative idea right from the start. So uh, what we do in design tends to be a lot of it's kind of similar things to what you just saw Simon uh, talking about, where we're really exploring ideas to, uh, to fit a creative brief. And um, I mean, to give you an idea, a project we did recently came in with basically just a client presenting us with a question. Uh, how, what does it feel like, or how do you visualize what it feels like to have a massage uh, that they offer? Um, and then we had to somehow turn that into um, a creative idea and animation. Um, and build a whole uh, series of uh, images and installations and experiences around that. Um, so then that idea comes in and then obviously after we do a, a lot of experimenting and throwing a lot of things away, uh, which is where Houdini becomes very helpful, uh, we, uh, not in the throwing away, um, uh, we then you know, narrow it down to a smaller group of ideas and then we start churning out uh, animation, um, refining uh, films and that's when things start to kind of take a shape, and then eventually we, we finish our projects, uh, hopefully somewhere near on time. Sounds good, and, and does the work happen at one location, A to Z? Not necessarily. Uh, we have offices in uh, the US, in three cities in the US as well. Um, brief that we 
are working on currently um, came from uh, China and then worked with um, creative directors from the mill all over the, uh, the world um, and then eventually settled on a creative team here in London. Uh, a project we did recently for View Cinemas was led by a creative director from New York with a creative team uh, building up the original uh, sort of briefs and um, uh, the treatment from which we worked. And then that work all came to London because that's where the client is and that's where we needed to do the job. Um, ours is quite different, not quite as glamorous. All our is in-house based. So we have a creative department of about 250 people. Outside of that, we have marketing and advertising actually within Sky already. So any briefs can come in from them. And it's very varied. We'll either be doing the design sometimes ourselves or we'll be following a short um, a shop board very closely as to what exactly is wanted. Um, most of the time, there is some input back and forth, but I think it's just like in the rest of the industry. Ultimately, the client will just come back and want to change. And the problem we have is it's very hard to refuse a client because they're just down the corridor in another room. So the director will just walk down on the way to the toilet and just stop off at us and say, oh, what's happening? That's awkward. That's a problem we have. It's a, a little bit different to the mill. OK. We do have that problem. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I mean, my, a lot of my experience is in, is in uh, traditional VFX where often the thing that you are doing, it, your, your brief is often take this real thing and recreate it. So the creative process sometimes is less, um, I guess, freeform than the kind of stuff that Simon described on stage earlier. Um, and and I'm, I'm actually very envious of, of, of his 90% R&D time. Um, you know, a lot of the time... Um, we, you know, we have 90% R&D time getting to the point where um, something is ready to show to the client, but it's, 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 it, you're not really showing the progress because it goes through all these stages where it's too scary to show them uh, and you don't want to scare them off. Um, so, yeah, it can be quite different from that kind of procedural work. Uh, it really depends, actually. I think we we did a lot of the sort of more traditional things where we would get a brief and we just have to do some visual effects on a shot um, in the last few years, we've been doing a lot more of our own sort of directed work. So we have directors now represented at Glassworks, and we all, uh, agency will come with us uh, with a brief, and we'll do our own treatment. And then from that treatment, if we get the go-ahead, we'll usually do a 3D animatic, and that's something that would good to be able to do in-house, so we can really go back and show the client before we film it, or before we do the effects, how it's going to be. And more and more, it's that sort of process, and actually, that's the most rewarding because you can go and you can put the time in there, you can do a bit of R&D on the side and then you've got the director usually sitting next to you in the room because they'll be like one of the operators as well and that's, that's tend to be where we're going now. And then also kind of on the subject of you know, doing work through agencies, we tend to be doing more work now directly with clients. So that's sort of something that's changed in the last few years and that actually is helpful for us because they want to, they haven't got the agency to go do to sort of come up with all the creative ideas so they give more of that sort of power to us or input to us and we can take that and run with it slightly differently. Um, Houdini wise, a jellyfish, it's uh, fairly recent. Um, we, we ha we, we've had it since June um, and I've been working, I was brought in to work on it. Um, we mainly get verbal sort of briefs, what we should do, and it's mostly traditional explosions or breaking stuff and all that stuff. And because Houdini is very clever, that means I can uh, overnight maybe make 10 different uh, animatics or versions or explosions, and we can show that to the client. Um, and you know, all that stuff that's been said before, uh, discussing back and forth and always changes and all that stuff, you know, client stuff. but. Houdini is great because we can make 20 versions in a night and he can go that one and then we'll go okay and then a week later he'll say mm, maybe that one and you know and so it goes you know. Thank you kindly for the Houdini plug. We're trying to keep it uh, industry a bit broad. Um, we'll, we'll get to Houdini as well maybe maybe in the next uh, next question. Um, so talk to us please about some of the um, major challenges, you've, you've, you've hinted at a few. Um, some that are specific to the studio or, or specific to the advertising industry. And, and maybe within that context, you, you can mention 
Houdini and in which ways it, it's helped, if, if it has. And maybe I'll start with you, uh, Peter, just to, to give Will a, a breather. Yeah, but, um, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> Some of the biggest challenges that you guys have in production, whether because of you know, the, 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 the pace of the advertising um, demands or, or something specific to the studio. Uh, at my previous job where we did uh, more advertising than I'm doing now, um, the turnaround period was a lot quicker. So um, you, got, you have to explain to people that Houdini, you can create these intricate systems and the great controllability, but it's gonna take more time. Uh, that's not always something people wanna hear. Um, so being able to use Houdini efficiently and quickly is a skill you have to sort of develop slowly. And it, it will take time. You, you find, your, find your own way of doing things because uh, as you've seen tonight, uh, today, um, there's a million ways to do everything in Houdini. There's code and there's friendly little nodes, which I like. And there's also the sort of golden middle path of doing things, of, of mixing the two. Um, right now, a jellyfish, uh, there's a lot of really big uh, volumetrics, big explosions, big, big data. And being able to uh, optimize all that stuff is just as important as being able to simulate it. So you can create these digital assets that take your explosions, your volume data, and make them 10 times smaller, and you don't lose any quality. And, uh, and being able to standardize your way of working when wrangling these huge data sets is uh, very important. So we came up, the biggest problem we had at one point was just the amount of data we had. And uh, Houdini has been very helpful with uh, dealing with all that stuff. Um, yeah, so I think it's already been alluded to before in one of the talks, but the biggest challenge we probably face, and it's, I think, standard across applications, is when you get client feedback and they want you to change something that happened back in your pipeline somewhere and you need to make an adjustment and how do you do that and ideally you're creating a system regardless of the software you're creating a system that will let you go back and change things if you need to but it's inherent with Houdini that you can and it's fully procedural and you can go back to the start and change something and I worked on a job um, that came out a few months ago and that had exactly that thing where I built something and then I had to change the shape but all I had to do was literally change the shape and the rest of the system worked and that's already been illustrated a bunch of times today. So that's probably the most important thing or one of the most helpful things with dealing with that, that challenge. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're all going to sort of end up, as we get to this line, saying the same thing, that basically um, it's, it's the sort of um, sandbox, rapid prototyping nature of Houdini that, that in, in a, particularly in a commercials environment, enables you to um, sort of work in parallel um, and you know that you can branch off a bit of development, leave it in your scene, annotate it, put, you know, put a little sticky note if someone else picks it up. Um, it's a sort of power that you don't really experience in other applications because they can be very linear and, and you put a lot of groundwork in and you get to a result, but, um, but you can't very easily change the result. Um, and so uh, you know, that, that ability to package development up into a, an HDA and share it um, with your colleagues is, is I think the thing that makes um, Houdini is such a powerful commercials um, tool um, because it's, 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 it's just so easy to share work. Sorry, Sorry maybe a quick follow-up. Um, how much R&D do you, do you and do you all guys get, get to do because you, you have to produce work so fast and, and what does it mean having access to HDAs and, and these other facilities in Houdini that help you accelerate things? Um, I mean, uh, the the R and D time you have it varies massively depending on the type of job. Um, you, you often, when you quote jobs, you often put R and D as one of the quotable um, aspects of a job. Um, but um, the more and more you build up a reel of 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 different types of effects work or different types of creature work, the harder it is to sort of justify R and D time on your quote because they're like, well, I've seen you've done that already. And you're like, oh, the system's changed and I want to try out these new toys. Um, and so, so it's, 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 um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's about sort of finding the balance between what you, can, what you can include in a quote and what you have to do on your own time and, and take the hit for. 
Lawrence? Um, yeah, um, R&D exactly from project to project. It varies massively what time you can put aside for that. Um, Clients, absolutely, they always want to change right at the end and no understanding of what that actually means. Houdini helps you out with that. The other challenge that we have in our studio is that we were traditionally a soft marge house and you know that doesn't exist really anymore now. So we are moving towards Houdini and to Maya, if I'm allowed to say that. We're going towards both things. Um, that's a big change for us because um, it's not as procedural as Udini, but obviously it was quite procedural and soft. When we moved looking at Maya, we lose some of that there. Obviously with Udini you gain a lot, but it's not as easy to use. It still isn't. I think it's been made a lot easier, but it still isn't as easy from a pure artist's point of view. We've got some guys who, as soon as you look at that two or three lines of code, oh, gives them a shiver. Okay, perhaps people shouldn't quite be like that, but a lot of people still are, especially if you're coming just from an animation background. Um, they're the problems that we're having. Uh, as far as the biggest challenge we're facing, it's probably also one of the coolest things about our job is that our briefs come in and they're very open. Uh, so we did a, a spot for View Cinemas recently where the, um, the brief was uh, passed down from an internal director and basically it was, I want you to invent and design this machine that encapsulates all the different kinds of entertainment that they show at these cinemas. That's it. You know, no no storyboards, uh, no rough cut, uh, some very, very vague mood boards. And, and basically that's, that's, where you're, uh, that's where you're starting off from. And so, uh, as Simon said, uh, R&D is really, for us, it's our design time. And the question there is whether we start, whether we hire in someone to start sketching some images in, in 2D or whether we start working stuff out in 3D. And more and more in motion design, we're hitting the 3D software sooner. And that can be a good or a bad thing because it can, uh, it can drive you down blind alleys or it can take a very long time to iterate different versions or even to explain what you're thinking. And that's where Houdini comes in for us because the procedural nature allows us to, um, it protects us against getting trapped into a situation where we've designed something that there's, there's some essence of that that we really like but we can't modify. Um, Houdini allows us to, um, to develop ideas um, and develop something hard to explain, but um, develop an, uh, a design that's really more like an asset, something that you, you build once and you come back to it again and again and you see it and you use it in just slightly different ways. But the essence of it's there and you have the confidence in knowing that the director and the client like it, but you can come back, make some tweaks to it and you've got basically another shot. And that's something the way a lot of motion design works now is you see the same shot or the same device being used in slightly different ways uh, with slightly different cameras and slightly different movement, and that makes it very exciting, and, and you get a lot of value out of that asset. And that's what Houdini is particularly good for for us. So you see that reusability beyond the project that you're on currently, it, or it depends depends on the asset. Do you mean type. reusing that asset again in another yeah. project? Yeah, uh, we do. We do create things like that, and um, my colleague out there, uh, James, has been creating bespoke assets that he thinks that we're going to be using again and again. Um, More of a general tool set kind of asset. Yeah, exactly, sort of, sort of broad stroke kind of stuff. Um, but I think the, the asset that we pick up, this is going to sound really cliche, but the asset that we develop is the knowledge. And so you figure something out and you take it into the next project. And that's, I see that happening already, even though we've only really been using Houdini in earnest for about six months in our motion design work. That's very cool, thank you. A couple of you have, have talked about or hinted at other packages and, and transitioning from other software. Um, Houdini aside, um, what, what's, what's the ideal software mix? <laughs> soft image? <laughs> All right. No, so we're, yeah, we're tra yeah. traditionally a soft image house, and I think that that had the kind of perfect blend of, that, like you mentioned, the proceduralism um, as well as sort of the traditional tools and, and all that kind of thing. You can even do compositing in there as well, which I know you can do in Houdini, but it was that type of software. And I think we, we were at, kind of at a crossroads where we were like, do we go to Maya? Do we try something else there? And then sort of I did some tutorials and I kind of we had someone come in, like a Maya teacher, and try and talk through some workflows. And then, yeah, I just thought, how am, how am I going to do the jobs that I've just been doing in Soft Image in Maya? Like, granted, I probably wasn't taught the most like incredible procedural things you can do in Maya, but I just realized it was going to be a challenge. And I looked at the work 
as a studio and the work that I've done personally in Soft Image. And then, yeah, the, the natural choice was to go to Houdini because it's an extension of the kind of work that we're doing and an extension of the type of work that I think we're being asked for in the industry more and more now um, from agencies. I feel like this motion graphic stuff, the stuff we've seen today is like on a trend and at the moment, everyone sort of seems to come to you with briefs and they're all referencing the same work and if you can't do this kind of stuff or at least aspire to this kind of stuff then i think you're struggling you're going to struggle in the future that's my opinion anyway cool. thank you tim anyone else i will say that it isn't about the software but it's totally about the software so uh, <laughs> like the only time i go into my is when somebody forgot to make me alembics so I have to go make Alembics, <laughs> and uh, then I want to kill myself, because Maya is Maya, and it feels like I'm 15 years back in time, stepping into a black box. And I know some of you feel the same, so uh, it, it's about knowing the proper, about knowing, what's the word? About knowing, you know, the principles of the thing, but having a nice package to do that in also really matters. So using Houdini gives me pleasure. <laughs> using Maya does not give me pleasure. <laughs> So I think it's a very glowing recommendation. Yeah. Uh, I think I was, I was going to say, from a, again, sort of referring back to more of a visual effects um, perspective, um, uh, it, it's understandable how when, when your goal is sort of motion graphics of the sort that we've seen before, you might see no reason um, and you might find pain in going into Maya. Um, but certainly in the visual effects world, uh, both in commercials um, and in feature film, there is such a huge, um, you know, talent base of of animators and modelers and and, and people that use Maya. Um, that that certainly to compete in that visual effects arena, you need you need to be using that software for now until until um, you know the, the 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 talent pool have seen the benefits of of the equivalent tools in Houdini. Um, but that you know that's a thing that will take some time. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, I've had quite a few people ask me lately with Softer Marge going over the last few years, uh, should I do Houdini, should I do Maya? And my answer has been Maya short term, Houdini long term, and I still think that's the right answer really. Thanks Lawrence. Anything else? Well, uh, I, I can only say that uh, in design we're a, we are predominantly a C4D department for our 3D. And the way that we're using Houdini at the moment is to uh, export Alembics from Houdini and open them in C4D and do our lighting, rendering, and output there. And um, I can see us shifting more of that work into Houdini, but for the time being, um, motion design is, is very much dependent on C4D in terms of uh, the kind of look we're after, but also the kind of artists that we want to use and what they know. And so that's really where we're most comfortable at the moment. Thank you, guys. Uh, another question, if I may. Um, how do you see um, advertising production and motion graphics production evolve over the next couple of years? And, and what's the implication possibly for you know, software out there? What should we learn from you guys? Uh, do, can, do you want to agree there? I, no, I can start. It's fine. Um, I'm sure the guys will have a lot more to say about uh, kind of various different ways that, uh, you know, the, that software and whatnot is going to develop. I think from our point of view, uh, we're, aware, we're very much aware that the, the days of the, the big expensive 30 second TV commercial are dwindling and we're seeking lots of different ways of using moving image. We're pretty sure in design that um, moving image isn't going anywhere and it's, you know, probably creeping more and more into the realms of print. So. We see design as a constantly growing uh, part of advertising. Um, and of course, there's all these different ways that we're using it now. So for instance, on a recent project, um, we were creating it, uh, we were designing assets in 3D. They were then being used to inspire uh, installations that were created at an event. Um, they were being 3D printed. Um, I think I can say without violating NDA that actually something we designed is going to be reproduced as a bar of soap. Uh, it's just. There's a whole, huge big world out there of, of new ways of, of using our work, and I think, uh, I feel pretty confident that it's going, to, uh, it's going to keep growing. Any thoughts for a software vendor in this context? <laughs> <laughs> well, Any I do, software it, vendor? Definitely, I think uh, Houdini feels like the future to me. It feels open 
and extensible and um, as I think Peter said, it's fun to use and I think that's something that um, when you get frustrated with your tools and you can't get out that stuff out there that you want to make, um, then you know your job's not as fun. Houdini doesn't, I haven't come up against that yet, I've only started using it, but um, you know, it, it's a fun thing to use and I hope it carries on being fun. Can we do, you're not off the hook yet, uh, can we do something to improve it in a way that helps you adapt even better to this changing environment? Well, I'd say by making it easier to use. I, I had a funny thing happen a few um, months ago. I went to log into uh, the Oddforce forums and um, thinking I was signing in for the first time. And I put in my username and my password, or my username and a new password and an email address, and it said, oh, you already have a login. Uh, you haven't used it since 2007. I actually had picked up a copy of Houdini in 2007, tried a few things and thought, nope, this is not for me. Uh, and it is only recently, in the last kind of couple of years, that it started to come back to my radar. And I think that's mainly because it's easier to use. And I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Lawrence, you um, mentioned shivers earlier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, more user-friendly, more artist-friendly. I know you're making big steps in that direction, but even more so. Uh, the other day, uh, we had a small job to do. I said, right, let's try and do it all in Houdini, start to finish. I started pre in it. I needed to build a three-node camera because there wasn't a three-node camera in there. Just simple things like that. Just, ah, oh, it's... If you want it to do everything and be that Swiss Army knife people talk about, then the other bits need to be there. For some of the stuff that we're doing at the other end, like the guys are saying here, brilliant, but just some of the simpler stuff. And can you put Cryptomat into <laughs> Mantra, please? Yeah, That'd be yeah, the so thing. We'll talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> um, uh, I guess in terms of what you can do to ensure you're, you're staying current with, with advertising in particular is, is, is staying current with the technology because, as uh, you, you referred to, the 30-second commercial is no longer the, the, you know, the only thing that we, that we work on these days. Um, and, you know, a lot of our content is 360 VR stuff and it might be real-time. Um, and so I guess it's just ensuring that you're, you're, you're covering those bases. Okay, maybe another question or two. Um, advertising and games. Um, everything seems to be kind of coming together or, or converging to some extent. We, we feel that on a daily basis um, um, at home. <laughs> um, a, lo a lot of what we develop in Houdini is, is applied both for film, broadcast, you know, and games. Um, what, what's your sense from your side of things? How much are you seeing that convergence happening um, and how much, if at all, is that impacting you? Uh, we don't produce games, but we uh, obviously make a lot of trailers for games. Uh, we use a lot of game content. And probably the most interesting thing we do in that world is that we're starting to explore um, a lot of real-time rendering with Unreal Engine. Uh, so if you go online, you can look up a project called Mill Blackbird, and uh, you can look up something called uh, The Ride, which is a, a film that... Uh, renders in real time and uh, does that through Unreal and basically it's a, it's a car race and you can change the car anytime you want because it's live rendering uh, through Unreal Engine. So I think as far as we're concerned, the, for us the idea of game engines in real time is fascinating and it's definitely something that we're looking into more. How that ties into Houdini, uh, I couldn't really tell you at the moment. Uh, there is an Unreal plugin, but we can <laughs> talk about that <laughs> Fair enough, thank you. Lawrence or anyone else? I haven't really got anything to say on that topic, I'm afraid. Fair enough, no problem. Um, Tim? I don't really have that much to say about it because I don't, like everyone else, I, I'm in advertising more than anything, but it is, it's good to know that there's another way now, another, more job opportunities, so to speak, um, that you can take your skill set that you learn here and then also now get, get work in games too. I quite like that. And then, yeah, as it was mentioned, and I guess going forward into the future, you know, real-time rendering is becoming a thing now, and it's probably been like that for a while, but who knows, you know, five years' time, maybe we're not using Redshift and Arnold and Mantra, maybe we are just trying to find ways to do it in Unreal, although who knows. <laughs> I like hitting render. <laughs> I will say, as a Houdini artist, uh, roughly speaking, uh, if you're doing games, VR, or film, 
if I'm doing a pyro simulation, I'm doing a pyro simulation. Uh, it's just about the output, and uh, so it's it's comforting to know you don't have to change that much to do all these totally different mediums. Even though maybe you can't have as, as many polys or, or all that stuff, but you still get to do the artistic stuff you want to do. You can still get to blow up shit, and it's great. Um, I mean, I think in the past, obviously, you know, people that went into traditional VFX, be it film or commercials, were sort of seeking the kind of the premium, you know, like the high-end finish. Uh, they didn't uh, feel that you got from games, but um, you know, technology has moved on mass so massively. And I, I saw uh, this this demo that's uh, on YouTube recently. Uh, if you Google it, Snapper's facial rig. Uh, I don't know if have you seen that. It's 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 truly phenomenal. I mean, it's it's a real-time uh, facial rig being rendered in Unreal. Uh, with you know um, you know skin uh, you know wrinkle maps and all this sort of stuff, um, and having worked on a project like that four years ago, I, um, I worked on the, the the Audrey the CG Audrey commercial that was that was airing forever on TV. Um, having done that in in, in in the offline sense, you know where you you know you you're not you know you're just traditional rendering, to see that real time rendered rig um, in Unreal that looked much better. Uh, is uh, is is really phenomenal. So it, it sort of shows that it's um, it, it shows that it's an area that all of us who have an interest in high fidelity images um, can get excited about. How do you how do you quote for something like that though? Because that's sort of like where I get really confused about the whole thing. Like if we're quoting on a job, and then you say, oh yeah, we're going to do it in real time, then. Uh, yeah, it boggles your mind. It's like, well, the render time is not very high, but then you the R and D is like years, and then I don't know. How do you do it? <laughs> I was going to say you double it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, maybe just one more question for me, and maybe after that, um, the audience has a question or two. Uh, what keeps you excited and, and, and interested going to work every day? Peter? Um, I get to blow up a lot of stuff and uh, <laughs> break a lot of Not stuff. Not for real. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's been like amazing seeing just in the last two years how Houdini has sort of taken off mainstream wise, just finding quality, good teaching materials. Like, only like, I'd say like two years ago was really, really hard. So seeing it now sort of become this trendy, cool thing on a big upswing is uh, it's a, it's a good feeling. And uh, that means I get to do a blow up even more stuff. <laughs> you know, so Sounds that good. keeps me excited. Sorry. Um, I would say that, so I've been doing this now yeah, professionally for about seven years and I started off as a generalist, I still am a generalist, you know, a bit of everything and I found in the last sort of three years, just looking back at the work that I've done and what I've enjoyed the most, it's been this kind of motion graphics style of, of work. So obviously sad with the whole losing soft margin ice, specifically for the ice because I thought how can I do this kind of work if I can't do it in other softwares and then it's great to finally see that Houdini is making strides towards making it more user friendly and then you do unlock all of this power and then you see all of this stuff and all of the tutorials from you know the Intagma guys and everyone all the sort of online resources suddenly makes it accessible it's exciting now to know that like yeah this is the level that we can go at and yeah you know it feels like the sky's the limit a little bit because of because of what you can do so that's why <laughs> cool thank you well I I'm just enjoying trying something, you know, trying a bit of software that's quite new that seems to never say no to me. It seems to, you know, whenever I, I try to do something, actually, when I start to learn how to do it, more opportunities open up rather than fewer. I don't feel like I'm constrained within a, a sort of box of presets quite so much as I do in other pieces of software. And um, aside from that, what I get uh, excited about is uh, just, you know, being able to uh, get paid to kind of invent stuff and to, uh, to work with other people who are doing that, very talented people. Uh, it's, it's not a bad job. It feels like play sometimes, eh? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I agree with Will. If you can put all the politics aside that get in a lot of places, <laughs> um, people pay us for doing this, which I still find incredible. I remember being at college many, many years ago, as I said, and me and a friend of mine were building a spaceship. Very basic, very simple. And we suddenly realized, oh, do you think any day somebody will pay us to do this? And, you know, they do now, and they pay us quite well, really, compared to a lot of other jobs. So, um, yeah, I still enjoy it. Um, just one good thing for the Udini guys. Um, I don't know how many of you actually use Udini or don't, but 
the support you get from Houdini is better than anyone I've ever worked with in nearly 30 years. You know, if there's a problem, they respond very quickly. That's not me. I've been told to say that. It's very true. Okay, that's it. Just for them. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, yeah, I mean, you're going back to the whole kind of the fun aspect, um, you know, a little anecdote, I guess, that sort of um, uh, shows this pretty well is, is the fact that a, a, a friend and colleague of mine um, who I, I, I brought with me to the Houdini Forum last year, who was a rigger, um, but a my rigger, uh, but he was very interested in getting involved in Houdini. Um, you know, some time ago, it was a weekend and I'd gone in because I was working and he was there, and he wasn't working, and he had no reason to be there. I said, what are you, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, I'm just, just playing with rigging in Houdini. And I said, why, why are you doing it at the weekend? He said, it's like a computer game, isn't it? It's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear that story more often. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much, guys. These are all the questions for, from me. Um, I'll pass it to the audience now. Um, anything, guys? Here's the big uh, orange toy. Any hands up? Oh, there's one at the very back. Hold on, let me throw it though, it's fun. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, this, oh, slightly too close. Uh, this is a very vague question, but it's not Houdini specific. Um, but you mentioned earlier that you have to deal with some, by the sounds of it, very vague briefs, particularly in advertising. I was just wondering how on earth you budget properly for that and don't have everything catch on fire and be terrible. We don't often get it right, to be honest. Uh, we get, um, you know, you, you, you put in a fixed schedule and you try to adhere to it and, uh, you know, the next thing you know, it's out the door. Um, sorry, not out the door, out the window. The job is out the door. Um, yeah, we find it really difficult. And uh, I really admire the, the fact that Man vs. Machine has found a way to uh, construct a job around this kind of R&D time, they call it, where they spend so much time kind of developing ideas before they put the final film together. Uh, we rarely get that opportunity. We are given deadlines pretty much from the moment we start. Uh, presentations, expectations, pressure, and uh, it's very difficult to work under those circumstances, and it's very difficult to, uh, to make sure that you charge the right amount of money, uh, particularly when you get into jobs where a lot of what you're doing is creating. You, know, you're, you can take a, you know, a traditional VFX workflow where maybe somebody turns up with a, a character that's been, that's been drawn and tested and, and taken through all the kind of advertising um, uh, focus groups and all that, and your, your job is mainly to expound on that we're dealing with something that hasn't gone through any of that kind of uh, that checking and we're trying to you know invent this stuff and sometimes especially with our uh, abstract work the client can turn around and just say i don't like it you know maybe for no good reason just i don't like it and there you are you've you, you've lost that time and you need to catch that up again so uh, we find it extremely difficult i'll be honest about that how often does that happen the i don't like it um, Less often now than it used to. Uh, I think we're better at explaining what we're going to be making and showing things along the way. Um, and we are more careful now about making sure that clients see things when they should. But uh, advertising is a business based on people's gut feelings and it's very difficult to, um, you know, to prepare for that. And there are a lot of people involved in the process and often we find we get pretty far along in a project and then have to backtrack quite a bit. Um, because, uh, because of that. And you know, it may sound like a bit of an advertising, but advertisement for Houdini, but it's really helpful with that because it means that we don't, we don't throw everything away. Thank you. No one else wants to hang themselves with that. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, yeah uh, all, of that's, all of that's good. What, if we are getting a brief, um, then we'll try and make a treatment, and then, and I'm, I'm sure everyone does as well, but from that treatment, we try and get our references down and we'll know a little bit about what we're doing and then at some point, yeah, we, we can kind of hold them accountable and say, look, we're going to do this, this is sort of the output and then before we go into a big production, we'll get an animatic out and that's, we'll even do that now with pretty much any commercial if we can, do a full 3D animatic and then we can really show the client before we do all the work roughly what it's going to look like and that helps a bit but, but like you say, it can just be, be a nightmare and you end up 
throwing away work and losing time and stuff. Producers as well. You have an army of producers that stand between you and the client. That's the other thing that can help sometimes. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Oh. Um, do you find it hard to find Houdini talent? And what sort of skills do you look for in a Houdini artist? Um, uh, it's, it's very hard to find. It's not hard to find Houdini talent. There's lots of talented people. Um, uh, but th there's probably not enough to fill all the demand. Um, and, and I think the thing that's particularly challenging um, with Houdini artists, particularly um, at Electric, with, which is a, a company that's chosen to, to make its entire back end Houdini, uh, is finding Houdini artists who are really into the sort of the look dev and rendering side of things. You find a lot of graduates um, at the moment are coming out and are, are only interested in the kind of procedural effects, blowing things up side of things. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, finding, it's finding those people that are incredible at look dev and, and, and lighting and rendering um, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, but ultimately, that's you know, if they're good at it in in Maya or they're good at it in some other package, they can be trained, retrained very um, very easily in to, to do that in Houdini. So um, it's not all bad. Um, yeah, I want to kind of add to that a little bit because we're we're new as a Houdini house. You've only sort of been really aggressively doing it, at least in Amsterdam, for the last sort of ten months. I think in London, a few more years on and off. But one thing that we see a lot on reels, and there's not that many reels, but one things that we do see is like a lot of just sort of shelf tool type of reels where you see it and it looks great and it looks incredible because Houdini out of the box gives you those options. But then from there, it's really hard to know, you know, what they're doing that's different, what they're doing that's more of a TD side of things. And yeah, so I don't know, my advice, if you are putting together a reel to try and get something for Houdini is get something a bit more personalized, something that you couldn't just do with shelf tools um, that really show off that you're looking into things a bit differently and you're not just kind of doing the same effects that a lot of people do. And that will help stand out, definitely, because it's challenging. It's hard on both sides because you see something, you think, wow, that's incredible. Like, they made that rabbit turn into fire and then it looks great, but then if you give them a sort of some feedback that's like, right, no, the rabbit needs to do this and this and this before it turns into fire. If it's not a shelf tool and they don't have that ability and it's hard to judge before you do it, then you can both kind of end up not where you want to be. So that, that's something I've noticed already sort of last year. I, I will say that if you're going to submit to something made by Houdini Tutorial, uh, it's a very small community. And if anyone who's looking at your reel knows anything about Houdini, is going to know exactly where that's from. And you see that a lot, like, oh, that's Stephen Nippling's Applied to Dini 5. <laughs> it's like, it's just, so just a word of warning, if you're going to use tutorials, like everyone does, change it up, mix it up, personalize it. Yeah, I think the other thing that we're going to want going forward is Houdini generalists as well, not just dedicated FX people. I think, like Tim said, you know, he considers himself a generalist. Some of the stuff he does is amazing, but he still considers himself a generalist. I think that's what we're going to need for Houdini, certainly, as the other tools develop. It's not just going to be for effects. So the people who can get stuff in and out of effects are going to be very valuable in the future. And I would say we're also looking for people who... Uh, Concentrate not just on uh, on technique, not just on the the how, but the the why. People who can take a vague creative brief, like I talked about, and develop a uh, a design and an idea around that, rather than necessarily saying, "Oh, I saw this on uh, on Entagma, or I um, I grabbed this from Grayscale Gorilla, or something like that," and then just kind of chucking it into your job. But actually saying, I, "I've looked at." Uh, I understand the brief, I understand the brand and what I'm trying to make, and I've got this idea that in incorporates all these different things that I've learned. Uh, when you find someone who's capable of doing that, then you know, your job becomes very easy because uh, you understand, they understand the job and they understand the process and they know how to make something really, really good. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that's all the time we have today. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.